last talk for this sec uh, uh, section is uh, Erica Hutchin, uh, sorry, Morgan Goulding from Georgia Southwestern State University. And uh, Morgan is going to tell us about DNA replication checkpoint in neogastropod early embryos. Uh, I'm going to uh, mute myself, Morgan, but welcome, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Can you hear me now? Uh, Here we go, Morgan. Can, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, let me get rid of my uh, chat window. Okay, now I can see my slides. Yeah, I'm just going to share some um, preliminary findings in my uh, adventures exploring snail embryos and asking the basic question of how do they control their early cell cycles and uh, and how does what's the impact on the um, patterning of the body, which is involving some precisely timed events. So. Um, I want to begin by setting the stage, introducing this phenomenon of spiral cleavage, which is how a lot of animals build their body, um, setting up specified founder cells in particular places, and then short range intracellular, intercellular signaling um, completes the body pattern at very early stages of development. So in this situation, the timing and, and geometry of cell division is very critical. Um, you can tell because it's highly conserved. We have traditional family values here with going back to the Cambrian. Um, and uh, in fact, we see very tight converse, conservation of um, detailed aspects of this pattern um, in many clades. So this is, a, this is the basic uh, cartoon of spiral cleavage. And um, this is what I showed in this paper published a while ago. Um, I stole it from Robert, um, who studied snail embryos in a descriptive work from the turn of the last century. And I'd really like to read this paper. If anybody out there is really good with French and English and embryology, then please get in touch. I would like help translating it. Um, I want to point out that this cartoon shows a primitive snail in uh, just to exemplify spiral cleavage in its simplest form. Um, what you see here is all of all four cells of each tier are dividing in perfect synchrony. And that's not what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about a situation in a different kind of snail where uh, every cell is um, gets its own unique identity from the get go and mitotic asynchrony starts out really early. And I'm interested in how that works. So this is a relatively fancy kind of snail. Uh, it's a big group of, of snails, the, the, the whelks and the winkles and the conches and the cone snails. The neogastropods um, have, they're the smartest snails, I think, and they're even pushing complexity to the earliest stages of development. So uh, Ilianassa obsoleta is the, the famous exemplar of this group. In the in embryology textbooks, you'll find it. Um, does this thing called polar lobe formation, which you can see at the one cell stage, the bottom half of the egg, the vegetal part, pinches off almost completely and then fuses with one of the two cells at the two cell stage called CD. The CD cell then is gonna form another polar lobe coincident with second cleavage, and that is inherited by just one cell, the D cell. And so now you have four quadrant founder cells, A, B, C, and D, um, where D is different from the other three. But all four are going to form, there they go, micromeres, a, a quartet of micromeres at the animal pole. And then um, all four quadrants form a second quartet and a third quartet. And that gives you the entire um, rudiment of the ectoderm, as well as some mesoderm. And um, these cells are laid out in this more or less rotationally symmetrical pattern, and they're ready to get um, patterned along the dorsal ventral axis. So, um, the classical experiment, first done in 1896 by Henry Crampton, was to just pull off that polar lobe and see what happens. And um, the two cells 
are now equivalent and they divide uh, at the same time and you get four quadrants, but they all four behave identically. So um, this was uh, further analyzed by Anthony Cal, who Clem Clement and at Emory, um, published in 1952, and he did these nice pictures you can see in the lower, in the lower row of, uh, of images, all four cells of the same tier are in perfect mitotic synchrony. And uh, compare that to the asynchronous situation and normal development at the top. All right. Um, so yeah, I was a maniac in graduate school. Um, ask John Wallingford, he'll tell you. Um, I did the entire, as far as I could, the cell lineage for the, the Ilianasa embryo uh, up until the 84 cell stage. And it's, it's all very predictable. I found many stereotype mitotic asynchronies, small ones, large ones, between sister cells, between micromere quartets and other quartets, or tiers and other tiers, and between serially homologous cells in different quadrants. Um, so um, this is this widespread thing that must be important. Um, and I'm curious about how the, how the cell cycles are controlled. Now, I wouldn't wish the task of, of us following the cell lineage on my worst enemy, but uh, we're working on live imaging um, to make it easier. Maybe we can get at these little cells. So the basic question I wanna talk about is what mechanisms control mitotic timing in the early embryo um, and coincident with really important body patterning events like the polar lobe formation and micromere formation. And uh, the first thing I, I stumbled across by accident is that um, Unexpectedly, uh, blocking DNA replication blocks cell division. So it's not like frogs and fishes and flies where the early cleavages are like, la, 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 whatever. Uh, don't care about DNA replication. Um, they will happen anyway. There is a DNA replication checkpoint in these embryos. So if you, you hit them with a phytocolon, DNA polymerase inhibitor, they don't divide. And um, so that's interesting. Is it the classical conserved DNA replication checkpoint. I think it is because a, an inhibitor of, of check one and check two kinases um, um, attenuates this, this block um, in a dose dependent way. And then caffeine, which, which uh, was known to uh, bypass this block back when I was um, a kid, um, it totally abolishes the delay. So um, I think it's that pathway. Um, now, I wanted to ask, you know, what's, what's this thing for? And I, I wondered if it is involved in regulating the normal mitotic asynchrony where the micromeres divide quite a bit later than their sisters. So I tried caffeine alone and it works. Um, all the micromeres, uh, sorry, all the micromeres divide early um, and, and, the, and the latest one, the normally latest dividing one divides on schedule with its cousins. So this whole asynchrony is almost wiped out by caffeine. Now, of course, the problem is caffeine is a very bad drug because it is reputed to inhibit V1, uh, inhibit the ATR check one or ATM check two or something, um, and, and actually stimulate CDC 25. <laughs> so, um, Obviously, we need to try better inhibitors. That's um, the future, for future directions for this story. Um, the, the, the last topic I want to ask about is uh, coordinating the cell cycles with these developmental events. Um, we want to, these things to reach the finish line simultaneously. So are they mechanically coupled or not? So, um, so we know there's a DNA replication checkpoint. and, and um, it, um, we know it works in the early embryo, but does it have anything to do with the scheduling of polar lobe formation? And does it have anything to do with the form of cell division, which is regulated in a time-dependent way, um, especially switching to micromeres formation? I'm going to show you. So first polar lobe, um, it was none other than Thomas Hunt Morgan, who after inventing genetics, um, started playing with snail embryos. He took off the polar lobe and discovered that they continue contracting again and again and again, long after they normally stop in the whole embryo. And so there's this intrinsic cytoplasmic oscillator that controls polar lobe contraction. That's interesting. Um, is it dependent on DNA replication ch checkpoint passage? In a whole embryo, when you treat them with a the phytocolon, the polar lobe forms on schedule. 
but they're ugly. Instead of nice, beautiful polar lobes, they are stumpy cones. And I'm sorry, I don't have a photograph to show you. I, I, these are preliminary results, um, although I've seen this a bunch of times. Um, so the, when you do this at the two cell stage, you, what I noticed is that the cells remain compacted as they normally do during interphase. Okay, so what I'm thinking is um, M phase entry, which depends on the checkpoint, allows the cells to decompact as they normally do when they're getting ready to divide. Um, but uh, the polar lobe furrowing um, is controlled by a timer that is independent. And that's what I have so far. Okay, one last thing. There's this legendary mythical cleavage clock that controls the onset of micromere formation at third cleavage, and then they, and, and that is repeated at fourth and fifth, um, where the well, spindle pole gets uh, fastened on to the animal pole cortex. You know, these beautiful drawings from um, Edwin Conklin, colored in by his wife, uh, and she did the drawings, um, show this process in, in beautiful detail. And uh, so what I did was I treated with a phytocolon in the first or second cell cycle, and I was astonished to find that um, when these cells divide, um, when they go through their second cleavage, a period, a period, a whole cell cycle period late, what they do is they form micromere duets. And so, um, yeah, they look like this. And, um, and so the cleavage clock is running independent of mitosis everything that happens in mitosis, and it's independent of, the, of this um, DNA replication checkpoint. Okay, so in summary, there is a DNA replication checkpoint, but I, I am not convinced that it is uh, involved in, in um, creating the normal mitotic asynchrony. Um, I am convinced that it has nothing to do with polar lobe formation or the cleavage clock that controls micromere formation. That must be something else. Okay, so um, that's it uh, so far. And um, I want, want to acknowledge Gary Freeman, who helped me um, get into, he, he, he was my grad school um, thesis supervisor, and um, it was wonderful to work with him. Uh, Chris Doe uh, uh, helped me get that lineage paper published. And um, currently I'm, I'm pressing on with the help from uh, GSW Foundation at Georgia Southwestern State University. And thank you to the organizers and to you all. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Morgan. We are we want to give people time for lunch before the 1 p.m. Uh, yeah. session, but John asked, Wallingford asked, <clears throat> and I'm not sure that I understand this, and I maybe <clears throat> I apologize. Uh, if I don't, if the cleavage divisions have a checkpoint, do the especially longer <coughs> cell cycle times than the quick cell cycle times in pre-MBT frogs, flies, et cetera? I'm not sure I quite understand that. Do you understand that? Yes, they do. So, any guesses, um, guess, any guesses what the clock is? Yeah, no, I, I don't. I, so I know that the, the, the cleavage clock uh, depends on, um, depends on uh, protein synthesis, as you might expect. Um, but apart from that, uh, all bets are off. We just don't know. Um, as for, yeah, John, John's question, the, um, the, the, the snail um, embryo cell cycles are generally about an hour long at room temperature. So yeah, a lot slower than uh, those of fr frogs and flies and, and uh, C. elegans. Um, but uh, it's not clear that this has anything, it certainly doesn't have anything to do with the presence of a cell cycle, of a, of a um, DNA replication checkpoint because um, I've I've tried blocking DNA replication in other kinds of snail embryos and um, it it doesn't stop cleavage from happening. There is no checkpoint there. Well, thank you very much, Morgan. I, I want to thank all of our uh, speakers this morning and all of the people attending. Uh, we're going to take a break for lunch now and then meet back at one.